This is Dr. Mobin Sayed from FLCCC's platform with one more episode of Long Story Short. Welcome. So the discussion today is very interesting and I'm going to give you a summary right now and then we'll go in the details. The summary is this. These are the researchers from University of Southern California. They had been running a survey since March of 2020 and the survey continued till of end of March of 2021. In this survey, they were collecting information from the respondents about their symptoms before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. And here is a summary. Here is something that is interesting that they found. They found that there are four main pathologies, three pathologies and a condition that is highly likely associated with long COVID. Number one, headaches. So during the acute disease, if somebody has headaches, their likelihood of developing long COVID is more. Hair loss, sore throat, and the condition is obesity. They also found that other chronic conditions, for example, autoimmune diseases, for example, cardiovascular diseases, renal diseases, cancers, these did not have statistically significant correlation with long COVID. I thought that was very interesting because there has been a lot of conjecture out there that maybe people who have chronic diseases, they are more prone to long COVID. Another interesting thing they found, which really struck me, was that patients who have lower respiratory tract infection or the chest congestion did not have a high likelihood of developing long COVID compared to the patients, for example, with sore throat or hair loss or headaches or obese patients. I thought, and I'm sure that you would have been thinking as well, that those patients who develop lower respiratory tract infection or chest congestion probably have a more intense disease. And the result is that chances of long COVID should be more in them as well. But that is not the case at all. So this is very interesting. How is this interesting further? The summary is over. These are the four things. Headache, hair loss, sore throat, and obesity. Now, why is this interesting? For a physician who is managing patients, that means looking at a patient's symptoms while they're going through acute disease can start giving you an indicator that who is prone to becoming long COVID. Secondly, I think it makes it very clear that prophylaxis or early management, aggressive management, doing everything in your power to not let the acute disease be too acute is a very important, not only for the patient in the acute state, but for the long COVID as well. So with this discussion, there are a couple of more things. So summary is done. So if you just wanted to hear what are the four predictors of long COVID according to this study, then these are headache, hair loss, sore throat, and obesity. Now I'm going to go in details And one more interesting thing that these researchers did was they said we looked at various other long COVID studies and they said we noticed that majority of the studies, actually they think theirs is the first one. So I can say from their point of view, they noticed that all these studies did not account for pre-existing conditions, not chronic conditions, but pre-existing symptoms that may be similar to long COVID and they did not discount them from long COVID. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. Imagine if somebody has chronic fatigue. So these are not the chronic conditions which are more risky for COVID, but chronic fatigue, for example. If they have that condition before the COVID, Then during the COVID, the fatigue increases, as they found out, and I'll show you. And after the COVID, the fatigue's intensity or percentages go back to where it was before. Now, they said that other researchers possibly took this fatigue and accounted that as long COVID, while in fact, that was a pre-existing symptom. So they removed the pre-existing symptoms from the long COVID. So in a way, they redefined the long COVID as a symptom that occurs 
during the infection and then persists after the infection but was not present before the infection. I think that there had been, there should have been one more type of symptom added and that is a symptom that was not present before the infection or during the infection but surfaced after the infection and is not explained by other reasons. That would also be long COVID in my opinion. So this is a very interesting redefinition of long COVID they did. Then they did one more important thing and that is they said the previous studies, majority of them, had counted or assessed the prevalence of long COVID by looking at outpatients and inpatient patients or hospitalized and non-hospitalized together. And they said that that causes a skewing of the percentage because hospitalized patients tend to develop more long COVID. So this study in here, they actually removed hospitalized patients from the assessment of long COVID. And then they added a model from the hospitalized back into this. So I will explain that. That I think is a very smart move as well, because now they can talk about long COVID that will occur in individuals who are not hospitalized. There are some limitations of this study as well. The total participants, I believe, are about 9,000. Out of those, the final group that they used was 308. So that is a smaller number, relatively small number. Although we see our healthcare authorities using even smaller numbers to make the decisions, but it is a relatively small number. Second, this is an online survey from where this data is collected. However, as the researchers say as well, that for example, UK's largest study in the long COVID is also an online survey. That is from the Office of National Statistics. Then the only good study in terms of non-online survey was REACT2, if we call it a good study, where they actually collected the information by individual one-on-one -on -one contact. And they found, uh, so this is another limitation. So what they found was, researchers, that the studies show anywhere from 10% of the people becoming infected developing long COVID to 70%. There are some studies that say that 70% of the patients who develop, who have COVID becomes long COVID. In the US, the Veterans Affairs Hospital's data is used to have a study in that 7%. There is a study from California that's at 27%. This particular study says 23% of the COVID outpatient patients develop long COVID. And the predictors, once again, are four. Headache, hair loss, sore throat and obesity. So now let's get into a little bit more of details. I think there is a lot of fascinating data. So let's start. So this is FLCCC. Here, if you see, various protocols are here, which you can go and access them. I think in the discussion of long COVID, this becomes important every single time to stress the importance of doing everything you can to keep the disease as much under control or prevent the disease as much as possible. And these protocols, I think, are a very good place to look at and to start. There are actually some parts of the protocol where I have contributed as well. So this is one. Then here is the study. This is a CDC study. This is not the study I'm discussing today, but this is a CDC study on May 27, 2022. That is post-COVID conditions among adult COVID-19 survivors aged 18 to 64 and 65 years. And again, I think here this is a mixture. So what does this study say? This study says... COVID-19 survivors have twice the risk of developing pulmonary embolism or respiratory conditions. One in five COVID-19 survivors aged 18 to 64 years and one in four survivors aged 65 and above experienced at least one incident condition that might be attributable to previous COVID-19. So this is CDC's. Then here is the study that we are discussing today. This is long covid and symptom trajectory in representative sample of Americans in the first year of the pandemic. So that's the first year. It's not Omicron related. Omicron, I think the latest studies, and I would discuss them as well, they show lower incidence or likelihood of long COVID, but still long COVID is possible. So let's look at this. 
before I go in the detail of this study, I wanted us to look at the following interesting facts that they have put together. Number one, here if you see, they said there are studies that focus only on hospitalized patients. They range from 30 to 70 percent. And I have a comment here as well that sometimes the post-hospitalization state of a patient has two primary categories or phenotypes, main big phenotypes, and those are organ damage during the acute infection and then the results of that disability of the organ to function correctly. And then the immune dysregulation resulting in the long COVID symptoms. So these are, in my opinion, two separate types because their management and their outcomes and prognosis are different. Here, I think in these studies, they do not separate them out. They just have a collective number. So that means if somebody got severe lung disease, lung damage after COVID, in hospital, they might actually just become, be counted as long COVID. That is why the range is 30 to 70%. Then the researchers show here, if you see the next one, there is another study, non-hospitalized individuals, 33%. Then they say there are some more studies which have a mixture, and these studies show the prevalence from 63% to 72% to 46%, depending upon when did you measure them. 30 days later or 60 days later or 90 days later. So for example, 90 days and above, 46%. 60 days, 72%. And 30 days, 63%. So they said these are kind of skewing factors. And so these studies are not generalizable. Then here they said there are two good studies. One is from the Office for National Statistics, UK, December 2020 study, older. And in this study, they had a survey of 8,193. This is also an online survey. And they came back and they said, you know what, 21%. Then they were 10% after 12 weeks. So this is what ONS actually says, that 10% after 12 weeks. Then you may have heard about the Zoe app and their studies, and these are also online surveys. Then this is the study Whitaker et al. This is 28,713 respondents. This is react to. And here they thought that the prevalence was, I think, about 30%. So the reason researchers bring this up is to say these studies are all over the place, depending upon what are the number of symptoms they included, when did they do the follow-up, did they look at the patient before or not, all of them did not, this is the first study that did, and then did they create a long COVID assessment by mixing outpatient and inpatient. So with this, they of course corrected for these things. So now let's look at my diagrams and go over some of this data that they have produced. So first of all, I said before, they say this is the first study where they have redefined the long COVID by including the symptoms before the COVID infection. And these were symptoms present in a person one month before the infection. They called it pre-infection symptoms. Then the infection, acute infection, and the symptoms during that. And then they did post-infection symptoms, and post-infection symptoms were three months after. So what is their basic takeaway? I talked about dates before. The takeaway is, if you do not consider the pre-infection symptoms, pre-infection symptoms, that means that somebody had, for example, fatigue before the COVID, and they continue to have fatigue after the COVID, but that got counted as long COVID. If you do not remove those factors, then in this study, 40% of the participants had long COVID. However, if you account and correct for these pre-infection symptoms and remove them from post-infection, which could be actually erroneous as well, maybe somebody had the infection symptoms, and even if they didn't have it, they were going to develop it for post-infection, you can't tell, but they removed it, and that is then 23%. This is compared to the UK ONS, Office of National Statistics, who said 12% after 12 weeks, and they measure for 12 symptoms. Whitaker et al. react to study, 38%, and they measured 29 symptoms. This study measured 18 symptoms, and the number is 23. So they say one reason that we might sit between these two is that our number of symptoms tracked are also kind of between these two. There is a study on California non-hospitalized patients already done. That study has predicted 27%. So 23% and 27% seem to be more in line. 
Now, what are the main predictors? I think this is the main takeaway for doctors. Headache, patients with headache, hair loss, sore throat. And what was the odds ratio? Headache, odds ratio 3.37. So 3.3 times the chances of developing long COVID. And statistically significant. Hair loss, 6.94 is the odds ratio. Sore throat, odds ratio 3.56. Obesity, odds ratio 5.44. Interestingly, as I said before, chest congestion was not a big correlating factor. Similarly, education was not, socio-demographic factors were not, the existing chronic conditions were not a factor for long COVID. This is very, very interesting. That means as a physician, if you're looking at a patient, let's say the patient has renal disease or patient has diabetes, then it is not necessary to predict that maybe they'll develop long COVID. These conditions are not associated with long COVID. They had removed fever, although there have been reports that higher grade fever is also a predictor of long COVID. However, they removed it saying that since fever at the infection stage is one of the potential predictors, we exclude body temperature higher than 100.4 degree Fahrenheit during the infection stage from our model to avoid multicollinearity. Those two variables have a correlation coefficient of 0.65. So they had removed fever from this. Otherwise, obesity, headache, sore throat, and hair loss. Now, the odds among people who experienced chest congestion were lower, 0.09. None of the existing chronic health conditions were related to having long COVID. The odds were not significantly different across demographic and education groups in either the full model or the model unadjusted for other Covariates. Very interesting. Now, in the long COVID, so now we're changing the topic. If somebody did develop long COVID, then what were common symptoms of long COVID? Headache, 22% of the long COVID patients. Runny nose or stuffy nose, 19% of the long COVID patients. Abdominal discomfort, 18%. Fatigue, 17%. Diarrhea, 13%. And once again, no likelihood of significant association with the socio-demographic differences, age, gender, race, education, smoking even, had no correlation. Now, details, online questionnaire ran for a year. Every bi-week, every two weeks, the respondents added their information. 57% of the respondents were females. And if you look at their breakdown for the groups, 61% were white, 12% were black, 22% were Hispanic, 50% of the participants had no pre-existing condition. And as I said, pre-infection, four weeks before, infection, acute infection, and then post-infection, 12 weeks after. And as I have discussed this as well. Now I wanted to quickly go over a table so if you want to go ahead and look at the link, in this study, there's a table that is very interesting and has all this data together. So I want to share a couple of things. Number one, this is symptoms that were present before long COVID. So authors are very proud of this way of checking for long COVID. Symptoms, for example, hair fatigue, 21 before, then 60% during, and then 18% after. So they considered that as not long COVID, but a symptom that was already present in these patients. Similarly, body aches and others. So they adjusted for this, which is very interesting. Secondly, if you see this one, here this is those symptoms that actually then persisted or became even intensified. So here if you see in some people, 45% had fatigue, for example, then 82% and then 50% increased and so on. So they then looked at these conditions as well. And finally, these are the long COVID symptom trajectories. So prevalence of new onset persistent COVID symptoms. Most common headache, then runny nose, abdominal discomfort, fatigue, diarrhea, cough, dry skin, body aches, shortness of breath. So these are all here in their percentages. And this is the table I wanted to go over. When you have a few minutes, please do me a favor and look at this table. What this table has is logistic 
regression model predicting long COVID. And here are various factors. For example, age, 45 to 64, odds ratio is 0.76, 65 plus 0.94, male 0.93. And if you see here in ethnicity and race, Hispanics have 0.72 compared to 0.46 in non-Hispanic blacks and 0.5 in whites. So Hispanics are at a higher risk. College education. And here if you see, this is the existing conditions. The only existing condition that was significantly associated with long COVID was obesity. If you look at the list of the remaining, they did not have significant data. Same is the case here for the new onset infections. And if you see here, shortness of breath actually didn't have much. So this is a very interesting table to review. So in conclusion, this study says 23% of the people outdoor patients who will become infected will develop long COVID. This is a pre-Omicron study, so it may not translate well for Omicron, but this is how it was happening. This study also tries to redefine long COVID, or at least for this study's case, they redefine long COVID. That is also interesting. And then they also compare this study to the previously done long COVID assessments and they point out some limitations there. This study has its own limitations. One, it is online survey. Number two, it is self-reported. Number three, it is a smaller number. The number was larger, 8,000, almost the same as Office of National Statistics UK, but the final participant count was 308. So with this, thank you very much. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. I would see you next week with one more episode.